Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Dale Harder is an ex-NASA employee engineer, owns a couple businesses, H&H Research, HHR Exotic Speakers. He's been in the UFO field for more than 45 years, has had regular visitations by E.T. Craft. He is an officer for the Cleveland Ufology Project. That happens to be the oldest UFO club and MUFON group in the world. He is what is called an experiencer and has worked with most of the known names in ufology. Welcome to the program, Dale Harder. Dale, it's good to have you here. I'm looking forward to this story. Hello, George. How are you? It's nice to hear your voice again. I'm fine. Uh, and thanks for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to this. Hey, tell me about uh, some of your companies, HHR Exotic Speakers. What is that? Uh, well, about 14 years ago, I went commercial with a uh, product uh, we developed. Actually, I have seven products, and it makes some of the most exotic speakers in the world. Uh, they're based on a principle known as the Walsh Principle, which was a patent uh, from 1968. And I spent, uh, well, about 45 years or, or more uh, working uh, on that principle to bring it to fruition, and we've uh, certainly got it to the point where it's pretty acceptable. How exciting. Now, do, do the speakers, are they used sometimes in concerts or just in the home? They have been used in a myriad of, of applications. They're not really for concerts, but uh, they can be used uh, in studios for mastering of records and uh, tapes. They have been used, uh, and they're most designed for home audio systems so that you can hear the absolute ultimate in experience when it comes to listening to personal music. Oh, good for you. Okay, I have prepared our audience, Dale, to be open-minded, yes. to listen to your story. Uh, later on, we'll take phone calls with them. But I okay. want you, if you would, kind of give us that version of Dale Harder and uh, this incredible story. When my producers called me about this and said, uh, do you want to interview an extraterrestrial? I went, yeah, okay, we'll give that a try. But but tell us the story. Well, you probably don't remember meeting me, George. We've actually met at least three times. Uh, the last time you and I saw each other and even had lunch was at CITD in 2015. Yes. Okay, that being said, um, a little bit about myself, and what I'm going to do is kind of start you off at before birth. And we're going to take a few teasers there, All which right. we will elaborate on, of course, hopefully as we go through the process. Okay. So the first thing uh, probably that I could tell you is that I came into this world uh, having full memories of where I was before that, what I did, who I was, and why I came. And uh, so I went through a rather unusual beginning uh, and birthing process, and uh, so that's kind of how I started. Was it a reincarnation, Dale, or something else? No, no. It actually, uh, if you will, I I, I remember uh, probably the funniest aspect is being on a craft with my people and them kicking me literally out the door as uh, uh, I uh, got to the point where I was to leave. And what had happened was I had changed my mind, and I didn't want to go. <laughs> I, was, I was afraid to come. I don't want to go and, to planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was afraid to come. So they kicked me out the door and said, Listen, you, you volunteered for this. You went through all the training. It's, you got to go. So, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so when I was born, I had this in my head. I remembered it. and uh, But I did go through a birthing process. I did take a physical form, human form, because you cannot survive here for a length of time or any length of time as a true Palladian. Uh, their physical vibrations are just too high, and our vibrations on this planet are too low. And you came in then as a birth little baby, right? Yes, I okay. did. And uh, 
through that birth process, uh, I was uh, actually, uh, when I was born, and they didn't keep good records of that, but I was uh, about three months of age, I was given up for adoption and left on the doorstep of Catholic Charities Organization. No. Yes. And uh, there was a, a short note with me. Uh, that said my first name, or my name was David Larry. I had no last name. Uh, and it also said that I was allergic to milk, and I had to be given goat's milk. But uh, basically, that was all that was known. And there was the hint, I say hint, of my birth date, uh, January 21st. And uh, so the records and everything regarding my birth were sealed and have been sealed, and I have not been able to obtain them to this. Have you tried to, court-wise? Yes, absolutely so. Do you... Even went through my uh, friend Dennis Kucinich. Oh, sure. Okay. Do you have an inkling who your parents might have been? Well, not not completely, no. No. Okay. Uh, there was only some conjecture into that, so I'll just leave it at that for this point. Now, That's kind of how I entered, and it was a little bit unusual. The fortunate part was that... The mother and father that raised me, a wonderful family, uh, uh, could my mother could not have children. And uh, at the age of 21, she had to have a full hysterectomy. Uh, and uh. her and my father were just married. Um, so they really wanted a child. And uh, lo and behold, they came along, saw me, and love at first sight, and one thing led to another. And they treated you like their very own, did they not? Absolutely treated me as their very own, raised me with uh, extreme love and attention, and told me the truth from as early an age as I can recall uh, of who I was and where I came from, you know, that I did, I was not their child. Uh, but that that didn't mean anything. But little did they know where, where you really came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were soon to find out. Yeah. How did that happen? How did you tell them? And then how did you, re- I mean, like you said, you were born with it, the knowledge of this. But when did it yes, really I hit you? I was born with those memories. But, of course, I couldn't, uh, until I was a little older, could not articulate that. And the worst part of it was for me is that, as a child, of course, up until I was able to uh, speak and communicate and do things in a a regular manner, I had a head basically full of knowledge of all the experiences that I have even now, but I did not know what they really meant. So my entire life has been growing into the knowledge and the experience. How old were you, Dale, when it really hit you that you are from another planetary system? Well, until I finally accepted it, you mean? Yes, that's a good point. Uh, I was 56 years old when I finally oh, accepted the truth. Pretty a late bloomer After then. A lifetime of people telling me, people coming up to me that I'd never met, coming up to me and telling me, you're not from here. And they knew it. But that, they don't. So that's how it kind of started. I find it fascinating that your race of extraterrestrials are the same that have visited Billy Meyer. The, the fellow Plajaran, out in Switzerland. Yes. yes, indeed, the Plajaran, yes. Do you know him? I do, and I used to communicate with Billy in the earlier years. Uh, knew most everything about his case. Uh, used to write to him, talk to him, everything, yes. Okay, so let's. I'm going to be asking you tonight two different forms of questions. One is your role here on this planet, because I have to believe you're here for a purpose. And then things that went on in your planet, of course, because I'm curious about the craft and how many inhabitants are there. I think there's not as many people as we have on Earth, right? No, not as many, no. But your, let's talk about your Earth life growing up. You grew up somewhat normal, right? Well, as normal as it could be for me. Um, because as I grew, say from the ages of four or five, that kind of thing, some of my abilities and my talents came to the forefront. And it was at that point that my parents began to realize that I was different. And they even nurtured that, especially my father, who was an engineer uh, for General Motors Terex Division, uh, Earth Moving Company. 
And uh, so, you know, even though he didn't fully understand it, he did nurture that. And uh, But uh, I, at the age of, uh, say, six to seven, I built my first laser, uh, which I've been doing all my life. And, uh, Amazing. I, yeah. And then I also, uh, I, I used to repair all the, the neighborhood's appliances and things like that when <laughs> I was a kid. Did you get that knowledge from the other planet, Era? Is it not? Is that what it's called? I was kind of, like I said, I was born with these abilities. Yeah. And now, honest to God's truth, George, is I grew up not knowing what it meant to say, I can't do this, I can't do that. I never placed restrictions on myself. If I wanted to do something, I would simply get up and do it. And it was not unusual for me to wake up in the morning, tell my mother or father, I'm going to go outside and dig a lake or a pond and do it. Literally, I did do that. I actually hand dug a pond. and Or to tell them, I'm going to go build a boat or an airplane and <laughs> go and hmm. attempt to do this. Now, here's a young child doing these kind of crazy things. And my father would say, you know, son, you can't do that. But I, I, he said, go ahead. So I would go ahead and do my best at it. And believe me, it surprised them the things that I could accomplish. Did you have uh, earthbound friends as a kid? No. I Unfortunately, growing up, I kind of, I was different in that I'm empathic, extremely empathic, uh, intuitive. I'm psychic. I have the ability to heal others. Uh, I can hear thoughts. That was probably the biggest killer. Hearing people's thoughts was like listening to a thousand radio stations at one oh time, and I had to be trained to be able to deal with this. It used to drive me nuts. But anyway, I'm growing up with all these different abilities uh, as a psychic and so forth, and I'm thinking, well, everybody else is like me. Guess what? They're not like me, no, George. They're not. And yeah. as a consequence, the other children were frightened to death of me. So when it came time to play or go out in school or anything, Dale was always alone. But I preferred to stay inside, read books, uh, have my teachers teach me extra stuff, take home more material, et cetera, et cetera. And I was perfectly content that way. As you got older, did you date? Did you eventually get married, have a family? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Uh-huh. Uh, I am uh, married now, and I have one daughter, yes. What does the wife think of the story? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should ask that. My wife uh, is a wonderful soul. She is uh, pure Chinese. I went to China actually to get her. Ah, uh, her name right. is Yin, and uh, or that's short actually for her name. But she is what we would call uh, extremely Zen. There is very little that uh, bothers my wife in mm -hmm. any way, shape, or form. And to give you an idea of what that means is that if my people were to land in the backyard, come and knock on the door, she'd open the door, she'd say, just a minute, I'll get that. <laughs> and I suspect nothing. they might have done that already. <laughs> yes, nothing bothers her in the least. <laughs> and how about the child? Oh, I'm fortunate. I'm sorry? How about the child? My daughter is uh, 31 years old uh, and has uh, three grandchildren. I have three grandchildren. And she knows this uh, this story. She has known about her dad being different most of her life, yes. Okay, now let's go back to the E.T. life as a mm -hmm. play RN. And what was the mission, Dale? What? Why did they want you here? And I assume there's more than just you. Am I correct? There are many, many here. Actually, uh, I was sent as, as in one of the beginning vanguard groups when forces uh, which was more than 60 years ago, to come to this planet. And our purpose, at least partly, I don't even know my, the full extent of my mission to this day, George, but the part of the mission was to come here and to help raise the conscious level of everyone and the Earth itself, because the Earth, is, we believe, is a living being. Uh, Gaia has to uh, grow and she has to change. And her right now, a lot of earth changes and things are going on because of those changes as she moves to a higher frequency, higher level of frequency. Now, with this occurring, people are also doing that. And this is partly what is driving a lot of the unrest in the world right now. And, and I've never seen it this way. 
No, it's 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 really rampant. Now there are other reasons for that, which I'm sure that you've heard of uh, through David Wilcock and oh yeah, and no. all the other no people well. I know, no and uh, I agree uh, with uh, uh, most of their assessments. Are so, we, as a planet, are you allowed to step in and physically stop something from happening? Absolutely not. You cannot. We are not allowed. We cannot. Uh, my people would never, ever come here and uh, presume to step in and do anything that would interfere with humanity's free will. We live under the same rules, if you will, that uh, Gene Roddenberry and his wondrous Star Trek used to talk about, the prime directive. And that is, uh, and that is part of the reason we're working so hard to try and raise the consciousness of humanity because when we finally reach a high enough percentage, when we reach a critical mass, so to speak, and enough people on this planet realize the truth and are aware that we need help and then therefore ask for help as a group, as a, as a world, then my people and others like us can step in and say, it's about time. Fine. We'll come down. We'll give you a hand. Or we'll guide you. But they will not do it for us. They want to lead us in the right direction, but they still want us to make the choices. What planetary system is older, yours or ours? Our system is actually older than the uh, current uh, planetary system occupied by the Pleiadians. Uh, they originally, now here's where the rub comes. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, the Pleiades are too young for people to come from that area. Mm -hmm. The stars there are, are, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of years old, not even a billion. The seven major stars of the Pleiadian system, um, which are blue giants, most of them, and then there are more than 200 other stars in that system, in that cluster. Uh, and uh, so those planets and, and star systems are a little bit older. But they originally, the Palladians came from the system of Lyra, a uh, constellation of Lyra, migrated from there to escape two things. One, wars and things like we're having now, and two, to come uh, and... Uh, establish a new world with more peace and things like that. So they, some of them left, and they migrated for years, and they finally found the system of the Pleiades where they found suitable planets. Dale, of course, is an ex-NASA employee, but he's an E.T. Is that fair to say it like that, Dale? I, I mean, I'm not being condescending, right? Well, I mean, most people probably don't look at it that way. Uh, I'm not the, the kind of an ET that people would think when you say that because I, I look just like everybody else. Although my brothers and sisters are very, very similar. They are human, uh, and that's part of the reason why they have such a concern over us and our planet. They feel partly responsible for us, and they are worried about us. Do you believe in and does the entire planetary system out there believe in God? Well, we don't look at it quite the same way as uh, it is done here on Earth. Uh, we believe more in what is called the prime creation, uh, which is a creational energy and so forth. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, to say that there is a God or isn't a God or anything like that wouldn't be a fair thing. As we evolve and our frequencies get higher, uh, that uh, what tends to happen is uh, that uh, we begin to see things in, um, completely in a different light. And so some of the information which has been somewhat hidden from humanity becomes more apparent. Well, let me ask you this, Dale, too. I mean, are you in constant contact with the other extraterrestrials? No. No, I am not. Um, there are many times when I am on my own, uh, most of the time, in fact. Uh, however, uh, it, it, when I do have the opportunity with uh, focusing on love, focusing on intent, and uh, focusing on gratitude, 
and so forth. When I go out to uh, call my brothers and sisters, literally, I simply go outside, look at the stars on clear nights, and, and it does not even matter when it's clear or not. And I call them. Uh, if they are of mind, they will show up. And uh, so they have all different kinds of methods of showing up. Most of the communication uh, is either verbal, which I hear in, in my head, mm -hmm. or they can also do a, a physical as well as a, a, a verbal uh, or a telepathic, if you will. One of the things that most people will get to see, uh, and a lot of people have been here with me and witnessed these things, is what, they do what is called what we call a flash bulb. Uh, and uh, you see a lot of people trying to use the lasers and so forth. I do use lasers once in a while to uh, communicate, uh, but only under very careful conditions because those things are quite dangerous. They could and be, sure I, thing. I simply would not use them at all if there was ever an aircraft anywhere in the sky. But uh, during certain hours uh, here, the uh, aircraft and things are shut down and the skies are pretty clear and quiet. So they come at particular times and they keep a schedule. They really do. Uh, but they will do what is called a flash bulb. And uh, if you are out there and you ask to see them, you'll see something in a dark area of the sky and it just goes off looking exactly like a camera flash where there generally is no star. And that is one way that they get your attention. Now, if uh, I use the lasers to communicate and talk back, I might make a flash around the area, never at the ship, uh, and they will flash back. Now, you know if you flash a laser out there at something that flashes at you and it flashes back three or four times in response to your flashes, stars, satellites, meteors, things like that don't do that. So at that huh. point, it becomes pretty obvious that there's something going on. Well, what do, what do their craft, what does a craft look like? Most of the time, the Palladian craft these days, uh, they tend to be what they call the light craft. They look like beautiful glowing spheres. Uh, they may have color, either blue, orange, sometimes a golden. And uh, most of the time, too, they're, they're uh, like a xenon white, like a xenon strobe, if you will. And uh, so they can be very, very bright. And this is when the craft is basically in between the low-level frequency of Earth, dimensional realm, and a higher-level frequency because it takes a great deal of energy and effort on their part to come from the higher level down to the lower level. So they tend to cruise in between. And that's when they call them the plasma craft. Now, then when they do come into the physical form and exert that energy, uh, there is all manner of craft that come. And I also invite other ET craft from other systems, such as the Syrians, the Arcturans, um, uh, the Yael, and the... Uh, uh, so there's various others, uh, the Blue Spear, uh, the Spear, etc. Are they all benevolent, Dale? Because David Jacobs, in a human, I think he's human... <laughs> Yes, yes. I he, know David, yes. He talks about um, that some of them are not here for our own good. I tend to agree, George, and my own personal experiences as an abduct, abductee. Uh, when I was younger and did not know, I literally asked for it, but I didn't know enough to know what I was asking for. And as the old adage goes, you better be sure of what you're asking for because you might get it. I tend to not gravitate toward grays, which are in most cases what I call a chimera or uh, a robot, if you will, mm -hmm. a biological robot, but nonetheless. Uh, and they tend to work with and for the, the reptoids, the reptilian race. Those two races I tend to stay away from as much as possible. Are you, are you scared of them? I'm not scared of them. Uh, I know that they can't harm me because I won't allow it. Uh, we, we do not, none of us, as human beings or otherwise, have to allow ourselves to put up with uh, their shenanigans, their abductions, mm -hmm. or otherwise. We can protect ourselves as simply by asserting so. Uh, but uh, they have uh, uh, done an awful lot of things that they shouldn't have done, and, and controlling this planet is one of them. Dale, I am sure you're familiar with the work of the late Zechariah Sitchin, right? Absolutely so, yes. What do you think of his interpretation of the Anunnaki, 
how they came down here, why they came down here, seeding us, basically creating us. What do you think of that? I think that the Anunnaki exist. I believe that they may have had a hand in the biological soup, if you will, that makes up the current uh, humanity. Uh, I do not think it quite happened the way that uh, Zachariah uh, determined. I believe that the information that he got and some of the things that he had determined by the Sumerian writing uh, was tainted. And I think that that came basically from people who would wish to spread disinformation. So the source that you get is only as good as the material you start off with. Now, I think that he was used and uh, to spread some of that disinformation, unfortunately. Why, after 50 years, are you coming out with this? Well, there's a reason. It's time, I guess. Uh, you know, I have been around a long time. I have lectured. I used to be very active in it. And uh, I stepped back for a while because, quite frankly, George, I got really tired of chasing the so-called lights in the sky cases that MUFON and other people were looking at, yeah. even in our own club. It, it got really old. We'd take one step forward and ten back. Sure. I wanted to move forward, and so I went off on my own, started doing my own thing. But as I did so, I also became a little quieter. Now, after, like I said, after 56 years, I'm now 62, uh, and I finally realized who I was and what I was. I became much more active. And at this point in time, I think the the planet, I think people, everyone needs to uh, take a step back and take a look. Now, I don't advocate at all that anyone believe what I say. That is not my goal. My goal is to help people to do and that is to pull their heads out of their cell phones, to pull their heads out of the sand, take a look around and research for themselves the truth. If they can do that, they may find that they have been led down another path that they shouldn't be down. And therefore, you know, the, the truth will come out. So we are in soft disclosure already. And so many people, uh, especially Dr. Greer and a few others, are working toward that. We all are. As a, as a species on this planet, what do the ETs think of us? What do the ETs, pardon me? What do they think of us? Think of us? Us being humans. Oh, well, they, they actually, they, uh, they think of us in a very loving and kind fashion. Those that, uh, like I mentioned, that are here to help humanity. But we're such a warring group of people, Dale. Well, so all we do is fight. Part of that is the fact that we have reptilian DNA within this, this, this physical body. We have been bred this way. And we actually have 12 strands of DNA with only two strands being active. Now, within the last 200 years alone... Our DNA has changed by more than 7%. If you go by the theory of evolution, that should have taken hundreds of thousands of years. Maybe millions. Somebody. Yes, yes, indeed. And somebody has got to be doing something with that, messing with that. Now we're getting to the point where it is becoming obvious that humanity has capabilities that are starting to bloom. And this is one of the things that frightens so many ET races to death, is that we're so unpredictable because we have such a wide range of emotion. And emotions are, are the one thing that a lot of races do not understand, cannot comprehend. So they're here, they study it, they understand it. Would planet Earth be considered one of the gems of the universe? Absolutely. It is rare within its own right, but... Life in the universe is the norm, not the exception. Uh, I believe that if you uh, were to check that you would find at this point in time that we have discovered more than 3,586 exoplanets. And uh, over 2,091 of those are planetary systems, with 603 of them being as, as multiple systems with multiple suns, very much like uh, the Star Wars showing the trinary system. I used to tell my science teachers, uh, Dale, when I was a kid, 
that there were other planets out there beyond our solar system, that there was life everywhere, because I said everything's the same in the universe. This soup that we're involved with in this planet, if you find the planet that's got its right temperature, it's got water, you're going to have that formula for life, and it's going to start again. And he, he used to tell me, Mr. Strobe, God love him, he used to say, no, George, this is it. We are it in the universe, and that's it. And I went, no, no, there's many others. And this was beyond high technology. I was right. Yes, absolutely right. You knew within yourself, within your own heart, within your own soul, you knew the truth. Everybody really, truly knows the truth. The problem is is that they've been duped into believing the wrong things for so long. It's time to shed that veil. It's time to open their eyes and to see. And anyone who wants to open their eyes to see the truth can do so. That's kind of like the teachings that Christ was trying to tell us. Those that have eyes and ears, you know, you can hear and see. The rest of you, you know, we'll couch it in a little bit of a metaphor so you don't quite get it unless you're ready. Then we don't break the free will thing. And that's all pretty much what it was about. Dale, what's the message? What's the message that you would like people who are hearing you tonight to say, you know, wow, I, I learned this or he told me this? What's the message? Well, the, the greatest message that my people, myself, anything that I could pass on to people would be learn to love one another, be tolerant of each other, be forgiving, be open, all right, to new experiences. Because when you love each other, when you serve one another, you're serving yourself. And that is what my planet, what my people with, that's what we live for. That's what we do. There's no such thing as lying and hidden thoughts where I come from. That Everybody knows their own things. And you have the ability to create anything instantly, especially in our realm. So as we leave the third and fourth dimensional realms and go into the higher vibrational frequencies, which is normal for all energy everywhere, you will uh, naturally acquire those those abilities, those things. All of this this third dimensional, low level stuff of, of wanting, needing, hoping, owning in the uh, Babylonian money magic system that will all drop away. That's all control. Humanity is at the precipice. We are just about ready to take that final step. So, opening your heart, learning to love not wanting to kill the guy in front of you that just cut you off or anything on the road, huh. yeah. that kind of stuff. We've got to settle down a little bit and step back. And when we do, that one act of kindness can wipe out hundreds of acts of negativity. I wish so many people, earthlings, would do that. Now, are the rest of the Pleiarans on this planet, have they made it into politics and science and things like that? I could not actually tell you truthfully uh, that I know that. I do not. Uh, I would expect that there are some in those places. Uh, but, uh, you know, personally, do I have knowledge of any? No, I do not. Most of the ETs, would you say, most all are just well-intentioned, good entities? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, again, like Dr. Greer states, I do know that there are some that are what we would call less positive uh, than us, but uh, you know, and they are they are still on the learning curve too. They are growing and they are learning because if you you look at the, the way the universe operates, exists, there's only one thing that truly exists, and that is light or energy. All things are light and energy, and light has two forms. It's either at rest or it's moving. When it's moving, it's light. When it's at rest, it is the physical stuff we call matter. Your desk, your table, your chair, your, your cup, that's light at rest. And that's why Einstein's equation works. E equals mc squared. Releasing that energy, turning it into light, releases that tremendous energy. So we're all moving toward the goal of becoming light again. Now, if you remember 
the movie Cocoon. I love that movie. Love that, that movie, was, that made me cry many times, in fact, both of them. But when they pulled their skin off and they glowed, mm-hmm. that's the way our people look. That's our natural thing, is, is at high energy level. And they're people of light. They're beings of light. We love, we feel, we, we even have sex the same. You know, huh. it, we certainly don't have, but we don't get hung up on, on licenses and marriages and all of that kind of stuff. How, how long can you live? Um, the average life of Blajarn is between 1,000 1, and 1,200 years. Wow. And when, and you, when you die, what kills you? To old age or some you disease? You literally get to the point where you move on, or you may even ascend to another realm, another higher level. Up next, we're talking about global catastrophes, pole shifts, and uh, some strange things going on with extraterrestrial. Gianni Noto, that's his last name, Gordon James Gianni Noto. He's been with me before. He's an attorney, contractor, ET contactee. And Gordon James, of course, had many childhood UFO and ET encounters. Saw his first UFO back in 1964, a one-mile diameter mothership launching three saucers over San Juan, Puerto Rico Harbor. He had his first vision of a pole shift in 1973. He realized the pole shift could also bring open contact with ETs. And here he is back on Coast to Coast. Gordon, how are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing really well, George, and I'm so pleased that you invited me back. It really means a lot to me because I have such respect for you. Well, I'm lo- I'm looking forward to this. And what have you been up to over the uh, past couple of years? Oh my God! Well, I'm still I'm still uh, working as hard as ever to uh, be in contact with ETs and get information. And I've I've become very close friends with Nancy Leader, and we talk every single day, sometimes several times a day. And I really have an immense respect for her, and I've been able to help her with, not only with discussion of the uh, the answers to questions that are asked by the public, but also personal things and stuff like that. Let's go back to the beginning, Gordon, about the ET contactee. What happened? How did that happen? With me? Yeah. Oh, it started uh, when I was five years old. It was a nice summer day, and uh, my father was away, and my mother, my, uh, my, brother, w- my brother was a baby, and uh, I was five, and uh, she said she was going to take a nap. So I went into the bedroom to take a nap, and all of a sudden, um, about three adult extraterrestrials were standing there and said, we're going to take you with us for a big meeting. And when they took me, and I'm not sure of the, the details, I mean, after all, I was only five, but I can imagine that it was something dimensional. And, um, and I found myself that I was an adult, and we went to this three-day meeting somewhere, and it was about a planet. And... And uh, everybody was so unselfish and kind and had big white auras, and it was incredible. And um, <clears throat> I came back, uh, um, and I woke up, and I went in the bedroom, and I told my mother, I said, I've just been somewhere for three days. And she goes, that's not even possible. You were dreaming. And I said, no, I know the difference between a dream. And that's when I first realized that things that were happening to me, when I explained them to other people, I wasn't necessarily going to be believed. Did they have a plan for you? Well, I I discovered, uh, yeah, I'm a very old soul, and Janet, who I said, the the extraterrestrials put Janet and me together after I asked them uh, to do that, and I was very specific. She had to be six feet tall and blonde, reddish blonde hair, blue eyes, half Scottish, half Scandinavian, uh, sees UFOs, psychic, loves animals, especially cats. I mean, all these details. And a year later, I accidentally ran into her, when I went out to lecture to two different UFO groups, and um, the, we had a date climbing a mountain in the Acadia National Park, and the next day I went back and I said, get all your stuff, you're moving in with me, and that was 27 years ago, 27 and a half years ago. That's amazing. Now, Nancy Leader, of course, uh, was one of the first to talk about Planet X, channeling through the Zetas, of course. What's the yeah. latest with her? Well, um, it's really interesting because... There's a movement from behind the scenes, I guess you could say, to um, make sure that this comes out one way or another. And the Discovery Channel called me up and said, we want to do a, a show on Planet X, and we want to come to your house and film. And I thought, well, that's the last thing I want, because I live in such a distinctive area. If there were any footage of the background, everyone would know right to the square inch where I live. So I said no. 
And uh, they asked Nancy if they could come to her house. And, of course, everybody knows where she lives. And so um, they went there, and this show was on the American Heroes Channel, a one-hour show. And she was on first and in the middle and at the end. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't everything that she would have wanted or that I would have wanted, but, you know, because they do these clips and they interview various people and they mix it together. But it definitely came out that Planet X is real. She's in touch with extraterrestrial humans called the Zetas. And uh, this needs to be told. So this is big news, really, if you think about it, that, that it, you know, <clears throat> was on a major channel. Gordon, are you still practicing law or, or are you no, I, kind of retired? You, after I was in Connecticut, I realized uh, I didn't like most of the lawyers. And the mob had taken over in Connecticut and everything was crooked. And I said, why am I inside with people who are violent and argumentative when I could move to Maine and work outside with my hands and have clients who are actually happy to see me. So that's what I did 32 years ago. And I was able to buy this mountaintop and I've got 34 acres at the end of the road, no neighbors, um, 34 acres of blueberry fields. And I look out at 300 islands sparkling in the Gulf of Maine. There's 3,000 altogether, but I see about 300 from my front yard. And I'm two miles back from the ocean and I figure this is going to be an island at Pole Shift. And on land, I've got turkeys, bear, moose, and deer. And in the water, I've got every fish, including lobsters and crabs. So, And since you brought up Pole Shifts, so where, where do we stand with that right now? Well, we've been waiting for the other shoe to drop for something to happen. Now, Nancy had originally said that there's a schedule, she called it, uh, out of 10. So 10 out of 10 is Pole Shift. 9 out of 10 is like total destruction from volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis, and eight is massive social change, and seven is where I first started when I was first on your show in 2010, that uh, first Japan was going to be shattered, then the New Madrid fall would go off, then a tsunami would uh, overwash all of the UK. And, uh, of course, that hasn't happened yet. And the Council of Worlds, which is a thousand unselfish extraterrestrial races working together, is uh, on the fourth dimension. They're trying to slant the whole thing, and the whole thing is the battle between, the I call it the final battle between good and evil. So you have a choice personally to be service to self and be selfish or be service to other and be empathetic and kind. So that's the major issue spiritually, regardless of pole shift, extraterrestrials, whether you have a new car, whether you got a good job, whether you're broke, doesn't matter. If you're a kind person, you're, the Earth itself is about to become a fourth-dimensional planet, and only unselfish people will, will be able to live here. So that's really what the drama is. And the Council of Worlds is uh, divided up into 40 working groups, and the group that's in charge in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, the North America, are the Zetas. And the Russians have their own contacts, and so did the Chinese. And there's no doubt in your mind that this is happening? Oh, absolutely not, no. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I can telepathically contact. It. The Zetas uh, don't, don't speak. They don't have voice boxes. So they can't put things into words, whereas Pleiadians can, and a lot of other races can. But the, the uh, Zetas send pictures. But uh, I've gotten to the point where when they send a picture, it it appears in my head as a picture, but also as words. So, and Janet and I together have had over 48 different incidents where we've had saucers in the yard, ETs in the yard, and even ETs in the house. So, uh, she's become quite famous. And I've been on uh, over seven or 800 interviews in 160 countries around the world. And we figure that over 100 million people have listened to us on the radio. And what's been the reaction for most of these people? Uh, excellent. It's just unbelievable. You know, it's so hard to find in local people in Maine, um, uh, people who understand what I'm talking about or friends or whatever, but I love the internet and I love the people who have contacted me over the internet and some really wonder, you know, even though I haven't met them, some of the kindest, warmest, informed people ever. And so it's really been a blessing to be able to do that. And I, I started a radio show on uh, Revolution Radio, but they can't. The guy who owns the rights to that name won't sell it. So they're on this website, Freedom's Lips, which is also spelled Freedom Slips. But 
I've I've done 146 consecutive Friday night shows from midnight till two in the morning Eastern time on Freedom's Lips Studio A, and I went from about 30,000 listeners to well over a million now. That's fantastic, Gordon. Well, you know, George, you had said to me the last time I was on in 2015, you go, you're cutting into me, Gordon. You're cutting, you're cutting into me. But, you know, um, who in the hell stays up at this hour except for me and you? Um, <laughs> you know, and the diehards. You can you can uh, listen to my show on archives. You know, for about the same price as Coast to Coast, five dollars a month, I think. Planet X. What's going on with that? Well. <clears throat> To re-explain this, it's an oceanic, volcanic, atmospheric planet, 29,000 miles in diameter. And um, it, it first was photographed by the uh, infrared astronomical satellite, IRIS, in December of 1983. And JPL and NASA announced that they had found Planet X coming, approaching the solar system. And the next day they said, and you've got to love this, they said, oh no, we haven't really found it, we're still looking. And uh, at the same time, Ronald Reagan signed an executive order that everybody in the government had to keep this top secret. So then do you remember when Bill Clinton had the Hubble telescope fixed? Yes. Well, it wasn't for any reason that you might have been told or heard in the news. They wanted a picture of Planet X coming into the solar system. And it's it's 29,000 miles in diameter, and it's got a, an atmosphere, and it's got clouds, so it's sort of fuzzy looking. But as it approached the solar system, the light of the sun fully illuminated it, and it has a twin-stranded tail, uh, one on either side, and that's the source of that, that pilot's wings, the, the winged globe, a circle with wings on either side. That's what it looks like. So the first, once they fixed the Hubble and they focused it on Planet X, they took this picture, and it was on the Internet because they put everything from Hubble on the Internet, and people went, oh, my God, that's a picture of heaven. And... Immediately, NASA took it down, but by then, so many people had copied it. And you can look it up if you're a listener and you want to see this picture. And you can see why people said that. It's this glowing city with a huge circle in the center and buildings stretching out on either side. That's what it appears like. That's why they called it the picture of heaven. But that's the first actual regular photographic picture that was taken of Planet X coming in. And uh, it entered the solar system in uh, 1999. And then it came around the sun going clockwise, as seen from above, and the Earth and all the other planets go counterclockwise. And as I've said on your shows before, and if you want me to mention it more in detail, I will, but gravity pushes, it does not pull. And um, so it, it came around, and it was pushing against the Earth, which, you know, the Earth's only 7,500 miles in diameter, but once Venus caught up and the dark twin of Earth, which nobody except the Zetas have ever mentioned. Um, it came around from the other side of the sun, and these three planets are pushing against Planet X. So we've been stuck in this position where we're not going anywhere. And I know you've had people on your show talking about crop circles generated from the Earth, but these yeah. are clearly generated by extraterrestrials because the symbol is a cup with three balls in it, and outside the cup, at the base of the cup, is a huge, a huge ball. And that represents Planet X trying to get by the dark twin of Earth, Venus, and the Earth. And when it does get by, that's when pole shift is. <coughs> Excuse me. And when this happens, is it going to be catastrophic to most Absolutely people? Absolutely catastrophic. Nine out of ten people on Earth will probably perish. Oh, my gosh. Now, you had a show recently um, on uh, the Fatima prophecy. Yes. And... Uh, um, that caused uh, a couple of us to look on Zeta Talk, and in, in January 13th of 2005, so this is the website, zetatalk.com. You go there, they have their own search engine. They have exactly word for word the third prophecy of Fatima, and it has all the things you'd expect, tsunamis, collapsing mountains, crumbling buildings, cracks opening up and swallowing up vegetation and people and buildings and vehicles. But on top of that, it has something that's never been mentioned before, which I, I didn't know until till I just had this read to me. I can't read it myself, unfortunately. Um, and that is that there's so much petroleum in the tail of Planet X, it's going to actually catch fire, and it's going to be like God taking a flamethrower to people of Earth. 
and people are going to be drenched in burning oil and roll around and try and... So this is a dim picture, to say the least. This Planet X that uh, you've been talking about and Nancy talks about, is this the thing that caused the havoc of Noah's Flood? Exactly, and the sinking of Atlantis and the explosion of the Santorini volcano at the last pole shift, which is when the uh, Jews left Egypt to find the Promised Land, was all, all those are connected. The last pole shift was 12 degrees. The North Pole moved from Greenland to the Arctic, and uh, this one is going to be 92 degrees. And what happens is it's hard to picture for most people because they think magnetic pole shift, you know, if the poles are going to flip. No, that's nothing at all. This is an actual geographic pole shift because um, the, the granite crust floats on, on molten iron. So as it comes closer, the north pole of Planet X is going to grab the mid-Atlantic ridge, which just under the water is like a huge iron bar, and it's going to go from below the ecliptic to above the ecliptic. And as it goes, the north pole of Planet X is going to pull the Atlantic Ocean up over the north pole. Now, the north pole is the north pole of the core, and nothing changes the core and nothing changes the north pole. But it's going to pull it up and slide it over the North Pole and then let go. And when it does let go, the new North Pole will be Recife, Brazil, the eastern tip of Brazil. How many people, Gordon, do you think are in the know on this? Millions, because it's clear that uh, all the leaders of, of most of the countries, I'd say 95% or more of all the countries, read Zeta Talk. And it's interesting because there's... Uh, there's a website where Nancy takes questions from the public. Now, she started this in 95, and she takes questions from the public, and then she asks the Zetas. They give her the answer, and she types it out. Lately, we've become such good friends that she usually reads it to me to find typos, but also we discuss it before she puts it on the web. But that's where you go to read the questions and the answers is poleshift.ning.com. And there's over 40,000 pages of questions and answers on Zetatalk.com because they get moved from poleshift.ning.com to Zetatalk.com. And um, so there's all kinds of diagrams. There's safe areas. There's every question. And you can ask a question yourself, but she has no tolerance for anything. All right. You know, there's always been talk, Gordon, that we cut a deal with ETs in exchange for some kind of technology. Have you heard that? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, there were several groups, and it's just like every every third-dimensional race and even fourth-dimensional race, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the government, unfortunately, made agreements with uh, selfish ETs. They didn't realize that till later. but uh, So the unselfish ETs had only one choice, and that's to contact everybody individually. But like I was saying, we're supposedly in the 7 of 10, but the 8 of 10 is massive social change, and so the... Council of Worlds has been working very hard to educate and open this up to, for everyone before it happens. So the date is known. They say the date has never changed, the month, day, year, and hour. They know it, but they're not telling us. And so we have no idea when this is going to happen. So those of you, us who have been focused on this could happen at any minute once Planet X came around the sun, um, have, like, when's the other shoe going to drop? But it, it doesn't seem to be. But on the other hand, there does seem to be, in a subtle kind of a way, a massive social change going on on the planet. And one of the things that I notice the most is is uh, people are really becoming aware of the selfish cabal and uh, the globalists who want to control everybody. And, um, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, some people say, well, the, the, the answer to that is populism. Well, you could have any kind of a government if it was benevolent, you know. But um, right now, it, it's trying to have massive social change so that everyone has a chance to make a decision for themselves. Do I want to survive? Am I going to? And, I mean, it's just so interesting, these little things that you, you would hardly notice. But remember how in a disaster FEMA is supposed to be in charge? Yeah, well, we saw what happened during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, well, guess, guess what uh, the president just did? He signed an executive order taking FEMA off of being in charge, put the Department of Agriculture. So why would that be? That's because we're going to have to move millions of people from the southeastern United States and the west coast and other places 
and they're going to they're going to uh, seize open farmland and move people there. They're not going to have to. They're not going to be in prisons. They're not going to be there for the rest of their lives. They're just going to be there until all of the dust settles, and then they can see what's left and move to where they want to move. So, um, you know, there's little things like that happening. Like, for instance, Nancy, if you look up Nancy Leader on Wikipedia, the most awful things you could ever imagine anybody saying about anyone were um, described. But uh, recently, somebody went through and changed all that, and now it's all highly complimentary. And if you do a Google search for her or for me, she's like almost at the top, or if not the top, and I'm very close to the top. So somebody likes what I'm saying and at the government levels or the powers that be levels, and they're trying to change the order of this so that people get good information. And so I'm very pleased to be able to try and help people with this because you can survive it. You just can't give up. If you give up before you start, of course you're you're not you're doomed. <laughs> Simply. So the, on poleshift.ning, there's a there's a part of it that says post your Planet X pictures here. Well, I'm a photographer, and I'll tell you, half these people don't know what the hell they're doing. But the other pictures blow your mind. I mean, a picture that was taken two weeks ago shows the sun and the disk of Planet X at the 4 o'clock position next to it, and it's spectacular. And People should go look at this and look for themselves. And, and the other things I'm going to mention here, there, there's all kinds of evidence. You can go to, there's a free program called Earthquake 3D put out by uh, Wolton.net, W-O-L-T-O-N.net. And that's the only place you should get it. You shouldn't download it from, because if you download it from somebody else, you might get a, a malware type of virus. Not that it'll erase your computer, but anyway, and it's free. And it shows the globe rotating, and you can scale it to all earthquakes in the last 24 hours up to the la- earthquakes in the last seven days. Gordon, as you look at uh, what's been happening and the kind of information that uh, has been leaking from the so-called Zetas, how involved do they get in our planet? I mean, would they stop a nuclear war? Oh, definitely. Uh, all the extraterrestrials, they have a way. You know how you talk about plutonium is so dangerous because it has a half-life of 125,000 years? They can change that to 125 thousandth of a second. So, and, and, you know, you talk about hacking and stuff like that. Do you realize all our nuclear silos? All the computers in there are using 8-inch floppy disks. I mean, nothing's been upgraded. And um, they've demonstrated in the past, I'm sure you recall the incidents where the missiles went offline. And so they have no intention of allowing World War III, and everybody should uh, rest easily, more easily over that. But we still have plenty of problems, though. Stephen Bassett, the expert on exopolitics, Gordon, uh, felt that if Hillary Clinton had been elected, we would have gotten more information about UFO disclosure. How do you feel Not about... Not at all. That's the complete opposite. Now, what about this current administration? What, is, what does it know about ETs, if anything? Uh, well, you know I, 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 you know, I hate taking sides and getting people mad, so I'm not going gonna, gonna to try and stay away from that. All right, the all fact right. is... The fact is that uh, extraterrestrials are working with Donald Trump. They are working with Vladimir Putin, and they are working with uh, Xi, the president of China. And the three of them have agreed there's going to be no World War III. Gordon, what do you hear about the secret space program? Oh, geez, I hear a lot about that and uh, very little that the Zeta say about it. Um, But I I have to believe there's a lot going on with that because um, I believe that we did have a separate uh, astronaut academy out at Vandenberg, and we had our own uh, secret space shuttle program, and we have, uh, you know, the Aurora taken off from Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean and going to Mars twice a week. I mean, you look at Gary McKinnon hacking into the Navy and getting up a list of um, off-Earth uh, crew on ships, spaceships, obviously. So the Zetas won't say anything about that, and there is a reason for that. On the fourth dim- dimension, the next dimension above where we are now, which we're moving to slowly, uh, at that dimension, they have to negotiate with selfish people to say anything about them. And they really don't care about promoting anything that selfish people are doing, so they don't really want to engage in that negotiation. And um, so they, they don't. 
And so a lot of times when you read Zeta Talk, you think, oh, if only one more question to be answered. You know, but the Zeta's attitude is, look, the most important thing you have to figure out is, are you going to be selfish or unselfish, and are you going to survive pole shift or not? So they don't really care what you think about this, the secret space program, but with all the things that are mentioned about it, I've come to the conclusion myself, not, not from the Zetas, but from myself, that there is something to it, but I can't put my finger on it exactly, but I'm sure that it's there. Are we still going through a number of contactee cases? Are they getting, well, people the are getting abducted? The, well, see, when you say abducted, it seems like it's it's against your will. And right. the, thing is, the, the thing is about people is uh, an extraterrestrial consciousness is united, unified, whereas a human's uh, consciousness is like a bomb going off. The the lower self says, I know, you know, the subconscious says, uh, let's say that an extraterrestrial comes through the wall and says, you're coming with me. Now, the lower self would say, I know love hurts, how are you going to hurt me? The conscious mind would say, I know this must be illegal and I'm going to report you as soon as I can. But your super conscious mind goes, I know we're all brothers and sisters, how can I help you? You see, so... They're dealing with different different feelings on it, but I've always felt that I was, you know, a reincarnated extraterrestrial, and that Janet, my wife, is the same, and plenty of other people who I've met and and know, and um, so, you know, <clears throat> we're here to try and speed this up and make a good outcome for it. Um, you, you've you've we've talked about how you said the Zetas would step in and save us from a nuclear war, but I always thought that they could not interrupt. Well, I'll give you an example. The other day there was a video, perhaps you saw it, where there's uh, this dense cloud and it looks like it's about to form a tornado, and in the center, cold air was descending. And then the edges, the hot air was rising, and that was about right. to begin the rotation for a tornado. And people said, what in the hell are these UFOs doing going in and out of this cloud? So the Zetas took that as a question, and they said, this is an unselfish community below the cloud, and they do not deserve to die. And we said, the Zetas said, that they would help unselfish people wherever they found them, in communities or individually, whatever the situation and that's not only at pole shift, but even now. So the saucers were heating the cold air in the center and cooling the warm air on the outside, and they absolutely stopped the rotation so a tornado did not hit that town. Gordon, let's, uh, let's, let's talk when we come back at the top of the hour about these ETs and the contact and uh, if sure. it's getting more prevalent or if it's slowing down. And then we'll take phone calls with people, too, it's, about this. Okay, it's accelerating, George. It is. Over half the world has been contacted individually. Now. What, is, what does that tell you? Well, the, the, there's a great need to up, update everybody so they have full information because it's the selfish people that have covered this up for years. And and nobody should be caught by surprise that, that they might die. They should have a chance to save themselves and their loved ones, and they should be have a chance to, to migrate to a safe area and work together to survive, and and there's no excuse for what's been going on with selfish people covering this up because they feel, well, if we have our bunkers and we have our gold, everyone else is a needless eater. We might as well uh, kill them. Welcome to everyone listening all around the world, all across the United States. We're coming to you live right here from the Coast to Coast AM World Headquarters in Los Angeles, California. I'm your host for the evening, Jimmy Church. Got a great show lined up tonight. Our guests tonight are William Henry and John Edmonds. This is Coast to Coast AM. Now, just imagine for a second, if you could enhance your skin with super skin, a translucent robe of light composed of digital technology that never wears out, and it just shines. It's illuminated. It's rainbow colors. Can you imagine revealing a rainbow light body from deep within yourself? Well, in the skinularity is near. William Henry shows how the digerati, or the technocrati, 
are using mystical technology to recreate the perfect light body that once belonged to humanity. And years ago, I had read a couple of books in the mid-80s that that projected the future about technology in our skin and wearing that technology. And I just thought that it'll never come to pass. But here we are today. Technology is here. The skin, skin ularity is one thing. The singularity is another. And they're both converging on themselves. Tonight, William Henry will be talking to us about that. And our first guest tonight is John Edmonds. And you remember the movie Poltergeist. We all do. And once in a while, you move into a new house. And you, you get your things there and you kind of walk around and you wonder who was here before. What, 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 you know, what's going on? And you wonder about that movie Poltergeist and you think, you know, could, could there be something strange going on here? Now, I purchased, uh, my wife and I, a new home about five years ago. And the one thing that I didn't want to do at the house was like ghost hunt. No. I didn't want to know. And if anything was going on at the house, let's just leave it lay. Let's let's let it go right there. I don't need to know. Well, John Edmonds and his wife purchased their dream ranch in the mid 90s, just south and in east of Phoenix, Arizona. And it wasn't imagine it not being a poltergeist. But aliens, and that's what was waiting for you when you moved in your furniture. And that story will be next right here on Coast to Coast. When I come back, John Edmonds is here. But first, the rules. Twitter is live to my left. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. It's what you want to do at J Church Radio. It's an interactive thing. I follow it throughout the show. Any comments? To myself or to a guest, I'm going to see it. If you make it good, it might make its way right here. He's a therapist with more than 25 years of professional practice, working with family, addiction, crisis stuff, the mentally ill, uh, forensic, PTSD. But he is the owner of the Stardust Ranch, and it's the home of the Hopeful Hooves. It's a horse rescue facility for abandoned, starving, or severely abused horses. Now, the Stardust Ranch is located in the Rainbow Valley, just south and west of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. But it has been the strange, strange location of UFO and ET encounters. Such events include many close encounters of the third kind with flying saucers, black triangles, gray alien beings. He's got video. He's got photos. He's got alien artifacts. He's got blood and tissue samples. They've all been collected and analyzed for a number of years as physical proof of the events as they occurred. I would like to welcome to Coast to Coast AM, John Edmonds. John, good evening, sir. Hey, good evening, Jimmy. Thanks for having me back on Coast. John, uh, I got to tell you, and, and you you heard my intro tonight. That's exactly how I look at you, sir. You know, you go and you get your dream house, and you're walking through with your with your wife and your family, and you're excited. And then things are not what they seem. And if you well, if you could, John, really quick, um, let's back up to uh, uh, your first walk through at the house and your encounter. With, uh, with 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 what could have been a friend in your driveway, because that was a kind of an indication of 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 what you were about to expect. Well, you know, Jimmy, it's it's it. The whole thing is is just incredibly strange. I mean, just from the get go, you know, because we looked around Maricopa County, and actually we looked around all over the Western United States for about two years before we bought this ranch, and when we finally found it. You know, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. My wife looked at me and she goes, it feels creepy. I don't know. And, you know, yet we still, you know, I kind of pushed and I said, hey, you know, I want to buy the place. We've been looking forever. Let's do it. And my wife, because she loves me, she said, okay, I'll take your word for it. Let's get it. So we bought it. And the very 
first day that we went to move in, all of the furniture from the previous tenants that was supposed to be moved out was in the big pool. We have a huge swimming pool, diving pool, and it was stacked three to four feet out of the water with all of their belongings. How did... We were just like... Yeah, how did they... How is that possible? Yeah, how is that possible? Well, we never found out because, you know, I called the realtor and I said, what in the heck is going on here? And he says, I don't have a clue. Just take the stuff out and put it out front. And and lo and behold, that's what we ended up doing because we couldn't contact the people that had lived here. And, you know, we ended up just spending like the whole weekend, you know, dragging stuff out of the deep end of the pool and putting it out on the on the front. And, it just, you know, no sooner did we put it out there, people came by and got it and took it. But it wasn't the same people that lived here. So that wasn't then, quite, uh, well, it's, it, I'm sorry, John, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that wasn't quite yeah, no a hair-raising event, but it was certainly strange. Well, and that's it, Jimmy. You know, it's if you take some of the, the incidents that have happened here and you just look at them just in the, the barest sense of that moment, they're not that scary. But when you put 19 years of living here together with all of the weird stuff, it's a horror story. Right. You know? And uh, the story that you were actually referring to actually happened the following Monday. My wife went back to work, and I was here at the ranch putting stuff away and trying to move in and, you know, get comfortable. And uh, it was before we had gates out front. And this is a pretty good-sized property. It's 10 acres with another five acres right next to it that's mm-hmm. connected to it. It's landlocked into it. Right. And it's surrounded by 180,000 acres of wild desert. So it's fairly remote. And uh, I walked outside because I actually saw this man walking up our driveway. And he kind of looked scruffy. You know, he had, uh, he, he just, you know, he didn't look like he belonged here. He kind of looked like a homeless guy. And being a counselor, you know, I've worked with a lot of guys that were veterans that have, uh, you know, gotten to the point where they're not comfortable sleeping indoors. And a lot of them will end up, you know, kind of, falling out of society, which is a a terrible shame, but it does happen. Sure. So this guy kind of looked to me like he was kind of of that, uh, you know, flavor. And uh, I walked outside, and this guy had like a machete in his hand, and he just walked up the driveway, and I met him halfway, and I said, sir, can I help you with something? Uh, Who are you? And he just looked at me, and he goes, well, who are you? And I said, well, I just bought this place. I, I live here. I own it. And he goes, no, 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 you don't own it. There's other people that own this property. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And he says, well, you see that building behind you back there? And I said, yeah. And I said, that's going to be our tack room. And he goes, well, that is where I live. And I looked at him and I said, well, do you have things back there? And he goes, a few. And I said, well, do you want to go back there and get your stuff? And he says, well, I live here. Why don't you just get your stuff and hit the road? And I looked at him and I said, sir, that's not going to happen. I bought this place. You don't need to be here. And he goes, well, I take care of this place. And I said, sorry, um, that's not going to happen. I don't need anybody to take care of the place. I'm here now. And he looked at me and, uh, you know, he said to me, he says, well, who's going to keep the monsters away? And I said, what? And he looked at me and he goes, I'm the guy that keeps the monsters away. And I said, well, I haven't seen any monsters. I don't see any monsters around here. And he goes, they're here. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know what? I'm pretty well armed. I'm very capable. I'll take care of the monsters myself. Please get your stuff and leave the property. And he looked at me and he goes, ah, that's just a bunch of junk back there. I don't care about it anyway. I'm out of here. And he turned around to walk away and he kind of laughed and he pulled out this machete and he kind of flung it around over his head a little bit. And he says, you're going to be really sorry. You're going to be really, really sorry when I'm gone. I'm the only one who can take care of the monsters. A machete-carrying transient walking in the middle of the desert who the gives you that, yeah, in the middle of the day with that kind of warning. Now now we're at the hair-raising kind of point. I'm sure you had to wonder, uh, maybe this wasn't the right property to buy. Well, you know, Jimmy, I was saying to myself, look, we're way out in the middle of nowhere, and there's always, you know, kind of the riffraff. And so I didn't really think about it that much. And it bothered me. But I'm not somebody that, that freaks out easily. And, uh, you know, so I just kind of, you know, shined it on and said, okay, whatever. And uh, slowly but surely, we began to see things happening out here. 
you know, and at first it was really exciting because, you know, I had saved up my money since I was about eight years old back in Evanston, Illinois, where I'm from, uh, originally to buy a horse ranch. That was always the thing that I wanted, you know, and so here I am. I put myself through college. I had lots of jobs. I saved up a bunch of money. Uh, my family passed away in 93, so I'd inherited a little bit of money. And I thought, man, this is going to be, this is going to be a great place to live. You know, it's beautiful. You look out and you see mountains. It's surrounded. They call it Rainbow Valley because it's surrounded by mountains. And then whenever it rains or you have a storm, the whole area fills up with rainbows. It's very beautiful. So I thought this is going to be a great deal. When you first bought the property, did you have uh, neighbors? I know that you have neighbors now, but uh, 20 years ago, did you have neighbors? Nothing. Nothing. We were the only place out here. Okay, and so you didn't have anybody that was able to walk over and knock on your door and, you know, <laughs> give you the background, you know, a, li- a no, little actually, help. That's funny you say that because the way we actually, the first, one of the first things that I actually ended up hearing about this place came from the uh, phone person who came to put the phone in. And when I first called to get a phone installed and to get, like, you know, direct TV hooked up and all that kind of stuff, Um, I couldn't get anybody to come out here. And I thought, well, man, we don't live that far from civilization. You know, surely somebody can come out here. And I finally made an appointment. They were supposed to come out, and they didn't show up. And I thought, well, that's weird. So, I, you know, I called them back up, and I said, look, you know, I really need to get a phone out here. And they said, nobody wants to come out there. And I said, what are you talking about? Nobody wants to come out. Send somebody out here. Just tell them that that's their job, and they have to come out here and put in a phone. Right. And they said, well, we're, we're, we're working on it. Finally, guy shows up to put in the phone and, you know, he wouldn't even get out of his truck when, when he first appeared. And I had to walk out there and greet him at his truck. And I said, sir, are you here to put in the phone? And he says, yes. And I said, well, what's the problem? Why doesn't anybody want to come out here to put in a phone? And he goes, do you know about this property? And I said, no, it's beautiful. What's, what's there to know? You look around, you don't see anything that's a desert. Right. And he says, we took, we had to draw straws to figure out who was going to come out here and deal with the, with you and with this place. And I said, well, okay, so you're telling me there's some really bad stuff or something about this? And he goes, you don't know the history, do you? And I said, no, I already told you that. And he said, well, there's a lot of bad stuff that's happened out here. There's lots of changes of ownership. Uh, the people that built this place into a ranch their son committed suicide the day before his his high school graduation when he was 17. And he said that was the beginning of just all the hell that broke loose here. Wow. So it's just one thing after another with this property. I mean, it's been used. Uh, it was at one point a, uh, a big gang hangout for uh, militia. Uh, it was a militia, uh, like, I don't know, safe house or something. Uh, and they ended up... Uh, you know, coming to bad terms with the local sheriff's department and apparently uh, all sorts of people, and they were run out of here. Lots of gunfights. Um, after that, it was apparently turned into a off-street uh, or off-track gambling outfit. They put in like 23 phone lines. They used this place as a uh, prostitution uh, operation out here. So it's had one thing after another. And uh, apparently the people we bought it from, all they did was just buy it from the bank. They owned it for three or four months, and then they turned around and sold it to us. And, of course, the realtor never told us anything about this place. So, you know, we walked in completely unsuspecting uh, to a property that had a lot of bad history behind it. How long was it from your conversation with the, uh, the lineman for the county, right, the phone guy, and right. your first experience outside, looking across the valley at the lights, how how much time uh, went by? Maybe two or three weeks. Okay, and 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 nothing strange in that two week period, right? Um, not really. I mean, it was quiet at first. We were excited, you know. We thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Okay, so three weeks later, you're at the back of your property. A beautiful night. Everything is is going great. And then you see something off in the distance. What did you see? Well, we started seeing lights. Um, We call them orbs because they look like golden balls. 
and they show up in groups of three, four, five at a time. Uh, you know, they're actually, uh, we found out in retrospect that they were exactly the same lights and the color and temperature as the Phoenix lights. We had the video that I took tested by a company called Village Labs, and they were able to scientifically document that it is exactly the same thing. So and literally, we've been dealing with the Phoenix lights for 19 years. And were you going out, uh, was this a consistent thing now that you knew that the lights were there? I mean, were you walking to the back of the property and just looking down to see maybe if the lights were there? And and how consistent was it? Was it a nightly thing, uh, you know, a little light show for you? Well, it, what had happened was in between we got horses uh, because when we first came to the property, we didn't have horses. And then what happened was is that uh, we gradually started acquiring some horses, and so we'd be out late at night watering horses, making sure they were safe. And, uh, the, you know, the more time we spent out, outside at night, the more and more we started seeing. And we saw these lights anywhere from two to three times a week, uh, you know, for, for years on end. I have lots of video of it. Um, you know, we have lots of pictures. So it's been going on for a long time. Any particular, I know some were orbs. Did anything start to define shape? You know, you know, the, the classic black triangle and, yes. and anything making noise? Um, well, we saw uh, triangles. We have seen what we call wings. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, flying saucers, huge monster-sized flying saucers, uh, the size of something like Phoenix Stadium. Incredible. Incredible. And now, this is the thing, and this is what is important here. Were you thinking us or them? Because there's all kinds of military bases there. There's Air Force bases. There's, you know, there's things going on in and around Phoenix. So were well, you... Were, and, and indeed, we actually have the uh, Goldwater military range that they use for testing. And, and you know, for it's called a gunnery range because they drop bombs and, and they do uh, all sorts of uh, weaponry out there. That's right. Um, yeah, we thought, we thought about that, you know. And we have Luke Air Force Base. It's about, you know, 10 miles north of us. And we used to have another base that was south of us. So, yes, you're right. There's lots of military out here. But I got to tell you, from what I've seen and from, you know, the fact that I've been about 50 to 60 feet away from one of those black triangles as it lifted up out of the desert, um, I don't think they're military. This is one of the most incredible stories. I uh, I interview and, and research into so many different contact cases. And the story of John Evans and his wife out at the Stardust Ranch is one of the most incredible and documented uh, ET contact cases out there. It's been going on for 19 years. I've I've talked to John about this quite a bit. And, and for the Coast listeners tonight, John, I want to kind of do an abridged version of events because it's 19 years of stuff. So let's try to do some rapid fire things. And uh, But th- what one of the most interesting things for me is when you lost your dog. And you started to talk about this right before the break. And you had to go out and find your dog, which you didn't do. We'll get to that in a second. But you find something else. What happens? Well, you know, Jimmy, what had happened was is that uh, I had a pit bull that had gotten loose. And she was kind of a stray dog anyway. So it wasn't that unusual for her to dig out or just run off and go have fun. And so I was concerned, but I wasn't, like, worried to death. I took the Jeep. I jumped in the Jeep. I went south uh, down Tut Hill Road, and I stopped, and I got out of the Jeep, and I walked down the embankment, and I walked up this little hill. And just as I got to the top of the hill, I saw a giant black triangle literally lifting up off the desert floor, and it got to the point where I was about 50 to 60 feet away from it. And all the hair on my body just stood up. And it wasn't because I was afraid. I was, I was, in fact, I was just kind of in awe. I thought, wow, this is really cool. And, you know, it was weird because it felt like there was this electric, kind of like uh, just static electricity all over my body. And then I started getting this weird metallic taste, like I had pennies or something in my mouth. And I thought, wow, I got to go home and grab my video camera real quick. Just as I spun around to take off, that was all I could remember. And when I came to, I was standing in exactly the same place, but I had the video camera on my right shoulder and it was turned on 
but all I had on it was noise. It was just making static, and there was just, you know, white noise on the actual video screen. And it was like two hours later. You hear reports, and, well, you hear reports of black triangles. You see them on TV and, and, and video, but now you witness it for yourself. It, was it a, a point where you just went, okay, all right, they're not crazy. This, 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 something is going on. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. You know, I was just like, okay, you know, what is this thing? I mean, is it a military craft? Is it a UFO? Is it from, you know, an alien world someplace? The weird thing was totally silent, and the color of it, it looked like graphite. You know, it was um, like a black, but it had like these little flecks in it of like silver or gray. Um, but I didn't see any lights. It, it was totally silent, and it was huge. And this was this was uh, about a year, year and a half before the uh, famous Phoenix Lights incident, wasn't it? That's right, exactly. That was uh, March. What was it March? Uh, 11th or 13th or something of uh 97 right yeah well this was before that and did you find your dog yeah my dog actually just cruised home <laughs> she got home before i did <laughs> like like a good dog should um exactly. and and now i i want to jump jump forward a little bit you've had uh, many, many, many uh, encounters, probably more now than you can count, of uh, direct interaction with some grays. And we'll get to the dark part of that in, in just a bit. But how soon did you start to make contact with the grays from the Triangle incident? And d did you make a connection between the close encounters with the grays, with the other lights and the triangles and things that were flying around uh, your property. Oh, and we also have the Brillo, uh, the Brillo men, and, and we'll talk about that too. Yeah, it, it, the whole thing, it, it was weird because things were just starting to happen in succession. And what had happened was is that after that event, and uh, we began to, again, we were seeing the lights in the sky all the time. But what really, really started to shake up our world and rock our world in a real bad way was the fact that we started having horse mutilations and we started having dogs that were killed. And, you know, we called the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department, the Livestock Board. They came out, they investigated. Uh, and these were not, you know, like horses that were uh, killed in any nice way. And we never heard a thing. We we live in a uh, very large brick home, and it is absolutely silent inside. You can't, you can barely hear like a police car when it goes by. It's so well insulated. And so we never heard a thing. And I would go out at night, and I'd walk around half the night, and I wouldn't see anything. And then I'd come back in the morning and find this stuff had happened. And it just broke my heart. Why do you continue to live there, by the way? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we got a lot of money in this place. And, you know, part of it's I'm stubborn, and part of it is the fact that it is almost impossible to move when you've got, you know, such a big property and you have so many horses. Um, you know, we, we have had as many as 100 rescue horses here at a time. Uh, currently, we have 19. And, you know, it, it's not easy to just pick up and move. We would love to move. Sure. Yeah, well, but I'll tell you something, uh, and, and if there's time, I'd love to get into this, and that is is that we flipped this whole situation upside down because it has gone from a horror story to something that is amazing because of a gentleman that came into our lives, and that man is a healer, and he is healing everything here at the ranch, and on top of that, he is using what you're going to hear uh, very quickly here about these stargates. He's using the energy from those gates for healings. And so we're going to turn this place into a healing center. And I think you should. I mean, there's something is going on there and it, it's probably been going on there for hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand years. You know, there's some kind of energy center. That's why there. the aliens are here. That's exactly right. I think that's why they're here. Well, I, I want to talk about the Brillo men. And I was just sitting here thinking I, the Brillo men happened first, right? Well, I call them kind of consistent. <laughs> I want the audience to understand. I kind of named them the Brillo men. Uh, I That's apologize. <laughs> I don't want to make light of this because it's actually pretty creepy. Um, off in the well, distance, in the dark, you started to see things moving around out there. Tell us about that. 
Well, I, I tell you, we, we started to see what looked like, uh, they literally look like, like, uh, you know, those SOS pads or, or, you know, the wiry little things that you use to clean pots and pans with Brillo, Brillo pads. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, we would see these large human looking, uh, shapes and they would be made out of what looks like Brillo pads and they would be walking around out in the desert and amongst them, you'd see these dust devils that look like the little tornadoes. And they, the, the tornadoes, the little dust devils, would go right through them without affecting them at all. And they're powerful. I mean, some of those things are 70, 80-mile-an-hour winds. And, you know, I, I actually went inside and got a rifle with a sight on it and started shooting at them. Sure. For the fact that I thought that they were literally the monsters that this first guy had told me about on the very first day that we moved in. And I thought, man, I'm not going to let these things come in and hurt my horses, especially after the kind of stuff that was going on with the mutilations. So, you know, we, we were real creeped out by those things. But uh, they're still here. Did we, you, we still see stuff out in the desert all the time. So did you ever uh, did you ever uh, go out and, and see if you had actually wounded or killed one or look for blood or body parts or anything like that? Yes, I did. And we never found anything. Uh, they just aren't there. Do they run? Do they hear the gunshots? You know, how do, no, do they react to it? Well, I, I, I'll preface that a little bit. We have these what we call energy pockets or portals, and they can be like any size. They can be from, you know, something big enough to drive a car through to the point where you could fly, you know, like a, a large bomber through them. That's how big they can be. And, in fact, we have pictures of some of these energy uh, portals and, and pockets that are on the property, actually on our website. Did they start to, and this is what kind of freaks me out, did they start to, like, get closer and closer? They weren't afraid of, you know, rifles and guns and, and the fact yeah. that you were armed and defending yourselves. They they were, you know, closing in on your property. Well, that's it. I mean, they actually literally just don't seem to have any regard for any kind of, of imminent threat at all. You know, I mean, I tried yelling at them. You know, I had a couple of dogs that ran out there and tried to, you know, bite them. And nothing happened. They just keep coming. And and you need to protect your family. How are you feeling personally at this point? Because things were about to actually go up a level and get a little crazier. But what do you do for your family? Were you thinking about taking your wife and putting her up in a hotel somewhere and, you know, and, and starting? Your, it. Right. You know, we talked about it. My wife gave me hell for a while because, you know, when things started happening, she kept saying, see, I told you this place was bad news. You know, we shouldn't have bought this place. You know, look at what's going on. We're not safe here. We got to move. And I'm like, honey, <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but unless you get a spare million bucks that I don't know about, uh, guess what? We're here. We're going to fight this one out. And, you know, besides, you know, for me, you know, I'm I'm from Chicago. I'm from you know the, the Midwest, and we don't just give in, and give up, and walk away. That's right. You know, we stand our ground. And you know, I, I, the more and more that went on, the angrier I got about it. And I just got to the point where I said, you know what, this is my property. I paid for it. I'm an American, and I have a right to be here, and I'm staying. And this is for me. This is when if if it can't get worse, it certainly did. And again, I don't want to be cavalier or make light of this, but things like eggs are being eaten out of the refrigerator, right? And when you hear something like yeah. that, you want to blame your roommate, you want to blame your wife, she wants to blame you. Things like this are starting to happen inside of the house, and then it goes to another level. What happens next? Well, uh, here's the thing where it starts to get really, really bad, and that is is that we literally started seeing gray alien beings in our house. And literally in bed at night and literally seeing them show up in the bedroom. And not just one, but threes, you know, always, you know, two or three of them at least. And they're not friendly, guys. I mean, you know, Coast listeners, these little gray aliens are not friendly. They're, they definitely have an agenda. And, you know, I, I need to say something, and that is 1973, I was hurt in a real bad car accident. I had a real bad skull fracture, and it affected uh, my physiology a little bit. And so I'm not subject to the fear 
paralysis that most people fear or feel when they are in the presence of these gray aliens. Uh, you know, they run that stuff on people and people freeze and they say they're terrified because they all they know how to do is just lay there and breathe right. and, and let them do whatever they're going to do. That doesn't affect me. You know, I keep a baseball bat. I keep an aluminum baseball bat under the bed and I keep a samurai sword right next to the bed. And these little buggers were not expecting somebody that was going to sit up all of a sudden and take them on and, and you know, actually fight back. Was your wife seeing the exact same thing as you were? She was totally unaware. Um, she absolutely experiences the sleep paralysis or the, uh, you know, just the frozen, can't remember anything, brain wipe kind of thing. She knows that she has seen them. She has seen certainly the tissue. She's seen the body parts. She has seen the body fluids, um, you know, and she's seen, you know, all sorts of pictures and everything else since then. So, you know, she knows it's real. Um, but the thing about it is when the actual experiences happen, they can do anything to her they want to. And in fact, they had. And that was the part that was the worst for me was because of the fact that these creatures molested my wife. What's the and, warning? Well, John, what's the warning that you get that uh, something is about to happen? Is, is there a temperature change? Is there uh, some type of electromagnetic static in the air, you know, what goes on or do they just appear without warning? Pretty much. They just appear, you know, that they, they have certain parts in our house that they seem very attracted to. And, you know, one of them was the master bedroom, the master bedroom bathroom, uh, you know, the, the, uh, sun porch, which is about a thousand, 1200 square feet where we actually have our dogs that is actually the location that I killed one of these creatures with a samurai sword. And that is where I ended up when I pulled the samurai sword out of the body of this creature. I had a piece of tissue on it the size of a big grapefruit. And I took that off and I put it in a, in a uh, container and I put it in the freezer until such time as I could locate people to talk to that I could actually get that DNA tested and get it analyzed, which subsequently did happen. What happened to the body? Well, you know, Jimmy, when you when you uh, have these firefights with these guys, if you don't take the head, they disappear. They literally just disappear. If Excuse you get the head, you get to keep the body as a trophy. Excuse me. Okay, uh, let me let me visualize this. Okay, let me visualize this for a second. Samurai sword hacks off an arm. What happens? They disappear, and the and the whole thing disappears. The whole corpse or or body disappears, including the arm. But if you behead, I'm just trying to visualize this. And again, I'm in the dark in the studio, and I'm kind of doing a batting practice motion with my arms. So I'm imagining a beheading, right, a left to right or right to left swing, right? Am I yeah. explaining this? Am I visualizing right. this correctly? And you behead. Then what happens? Head falls off, body stays. And then what do you do with the body? Well, at that point, <laughs> it, it's uh, it's a question of, uh, you know, how big is your freezer? Right, right. I have three of them. You have three freezers or three bodies? Mm -hmm. No, I have three freezers. <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with Stuffed with alien bodies? Well, I'm not even going to go there. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that, that uh, there have been numerous testing done on, uh, you know, the fluids and, and the tissues. Uh, a, uh, uh, Dr. Levengood was the person who actually did the testing. We got a preliminary report from him, uh, including micrographs. And then what happened was suddenly he became very fearful and he stopped talking about the whole thing, and he never released the entire report. All we have is the very first part of it. Several uh, notable individuals from the UFO field contacted him to try to get the rest, and he just wouldn't release it. And then the next thing we know, suddenly he was dead. It's one of the most incredible stories uh, that you're going through up at, at the Stardust. And we're going to be up against a break, and I want to thank you uh, for coming on tonight. And we'll get you on again for uh, a, a more details on this. But before I let you go, 
What is going on today? I mean, have you had contact this week or last week? Is this still ongoing? Well, yeah, we have contact. But see, what's really interesting about this is is that uh, subsequently from the incident that I just described, you know, I I got real serious about trying to get some support. And so I started reaching out through, you know, different various uh, emails and, and on the Internet to people. And lo and behold, we actually started getting people that were from off-world that wanted to try to help us to try to get some control out here. And we actually ended up with a group of seven individuals uh, from different races that came here and sat in our living room, proved to us that they were from off-world, and they actually began to help us. And we're at the point now where we're actually organizing uh, and inviting these individuals to keep coming back, not just to help us with what's going on here on the ranch, but to help us to try to put together some solutions for the world with worldwide problems. I want to thank you, John Edmonds. It's an incredible story. I want you to be safe out there. And you can go to Coast to Coast AM and uh, just click on John's name right there, and you can make uh, contact with uh, John yourself. And there you go. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for listening to Coast to Coast AM on our official YouTube channel. I'm your host, George Norrie. And don't forget to visit the Coast Insider membership area on coasttocoastam.com, where you can access our past, upcoming, and classic shows. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.